Um, so first of all, I would like to thank uh, Jairo and his team for making this SPICE uh, an event that uh, connects so many people around the world and that allows scientific order organizers to apply and uh, organize it. And of course, I would like to, to thank Mario and Jason and all the other scientific organizers for, for inviting me and giving this opportunity to talk here. Um, yeah, unfortunately, uh, we can't meet in person. It would have been, of course, much more fun to talk to all of you guys. But OK, let's try to, to make it as good as possible also via this format. And um, I was asked to give a little bit of a tutorial. Um, and uh, well, it's an honor to be the first speaker, but also this poses some challenge on me. And um, before I come to my to my own uh, topic in the in the details of this tuning of exchange and potential scattering, um, I uh, will introduce you to the states that are actually associated to it, which are the Yushibaruzinov states and how they are connected to topological superconductivity. Um, but this has been a work that, that my lab has uh, worked on for, for the last several years. And I would really like to thank the people who were involved. And these are mainly PhD students. So this was Leticia Farinacci, Eva Liebhaber, who's currently still there, Michael Ruby, and as postdocs, Gael Riecht and Benjamin Heinrich. And uh, all this wouldn't be um, so nice and uh, successful if we hadn't had this collaboration with Felix von Oppen from the theory side and his PhD students. In this case, I'm going to show um, also simulations from Sergio Acero Gonzalez. And uh, well, the title of the session uh, was the topological superconductivity and magnetism in uh, TMDCs. And uh, we have a little bit of work on transition metal d cogonides, namely on niobium diselenide and single atoms on top of these. And these samples have been supplied by Kai Rosnagel and Sebastian Rolf uh, from the University of Kiel. So let me come to my introduction about um, how to create, in the end, that's the goal, uh, topological superconductivity made from individual ad atoms. But in order to, to go through this step, we need to understand what these individual ad atoms actually do on a superconducting surface. And I will show you that they induce these so-called Yushiba Rusinov states. Often they are just abbreviated as Shiba states. Um, and as this is going to be an experimental talk, uh, I would like to explain how we actually measure them. We can localize them on the atomic scale with the scanning tunnel microscope, but we should understand what the measurement process indeed is, what the excitations are um, that make us uh, able to, to observe these YSR states. And obviously, a single uh, Shiba state is not enough to create topological supercarbon activity, but in the end, you somehow need either to couple these um, YSR states and this is one option to, to create a topological superconductivity and Majorana states. Or it has been shown before that other ad atoms, which are actually in a different regime, namely strongly coupled, they induce Majorana zero modes um, at the very ends of, for example, iron chains on the lead surface. That was the uh, first example where it has been shown. Well, this tells you that there are already some um, systems around where it uh, has been successfully shown that they host Majorana zero modes. But as I said, there would be this other strategy to create them from the individual building blocks of Yushiba Rusinov states. But for that, we need to maybe understand how we can tune the energies inside the superconducting energy gap. And this is what I will talk about um, then in the main part of the recent experimental results, so to say. OK, but let me start with the Yushiba Rusinov states and basically the classical description, um, for which uh, suffices to understand many of the concepts that are behind. Obviously, they could also be associated to quantum states, but in many cases, for the basic understanding, this is not necessarily not necessary. OK, so um, a Shiba state arises when you, for example, put a magnetic atom on top of an S-wave superconductor. And um, here you see the essential uh, interactions that you have. So you have some exchange coupling to the superconductor, and the superconductor um, itself is of course a condensate of Cooper pairs that are here visualized by these spin up and spin down electrons, which um, are held together by a certain coupling, um, which is characterized by the superconducting order parameter. And from this, you may already see that there are some competing interactions taking place. So imagine you have an antiferromagnetic exchange coupling. You kind of tend to pull on one of the electrons of the Cooper pair uh, while the other one is repelled. And this tells you that something should happen here um, with this um, uh, superconducting order, at least at the local scale. And actually, this is the reason why we induce um, bound states. And these bound states, as I will show, occur in a quasi-particle density of states picture inside of the superconducting energy gap. So indeed, this scheme that I'm showing here will be important through the uh, rest of the talk, because essentially, it's a quasi-particle excitation spectrum 
So you see here the um, superconducting quasi-particle density of stage, which is, which is characterized by the superconducting order parameter, the pairing energy, which tells you how large is the gap around the Fermi level. And then these bound state, they are localized inside the superconducting gap. And as you can maybe imagine from a very simple picture is because you have this exchange coupling, you kind of tend to loosen the interaction energy of the, of the Kupa pairs. Now, these bound states um, are then due to kind of a pair breaking and the strength of the pair breaking, of course, depends on the amount of the exchange coupling strength J. Um, I will uh, restrict myself to um, S-wave superconductors, and here only magnetic scattering is, uh, is um, uh, inducing a pair breaking potential, while in other superconductors that will be treated throughout this workshop, um, it's not only the um, magnetic potential which is pair breaking, but it could also be potential scattering, but this is not the focus of my talk today. Um, instead, I will um, also, as I said, refrain to S-wave superconductors, actually lead and niobium diselenide. And there's also another theoretical prediction, not only that you have these subgap states as bound states, but also that you have a local suppression um, of the superconducting gap. And this is experimentally very difficult to, to measure. There are some experiments around that try to do this, um, but very few. Uh, and then I should say that when you go to the limit of many impurities, obviously at some point I will show you that you have coupling between the states. Eventually you form bands. And uh, if you have too many impurities, of course, let's say in a bulk system, you eventually even um, close the superconducting gap. So just a brief slide on the, on the theoretical description. So I said that there's potential scattering and uh, magnetic scattering. And this exchange scattering is the one, as I said, which is uh, giving rise to the pair breaking and the bound states. Um, but I don't want to forget about this potential scattering. It's often neglected because you can't directly see its expression in the uh, causal particle in, uh, um, excitation spectrum, but still it is there and it is actually there. Um, um, and you will see it gives rise to an asymmetry in the bound states in the intensity of the bound states while they still keep uh, symmetric in energy around the Fermi level. Um, they are asymmetric in its uh, intensities. And this is, in, in the end due to this potential scattering on the surface. Well, often then it's just talk, treated as a delta potential and uh, that's reasonable mostly because also then it's screened away quickly in the material. Well, and then this exchange scattering potential um, is of course uh, captured by because you have a magnetic uh, atom, for example, on the surface, which is carrying a spin and then you have the conduction electrons and here's the exchange coupling strengths. And in the most simple um, treatments, this is also treated as point blank scattering, but uh, this is not necessarily the case in all the, um, the systems. And here I will show you that you have to be a little bit more careful in how to actually design this uh, scattering potential. Okay, when you set up all your Schrodinger equation and you solve it, you can solve for the, for the bound state energy. So this is basically where you find your excitation inside the superconducting energy gap, which is delta. And here you find an expression, which now I abbreviated with these um, uh, variables A and B, where basically in A, you have the exchange scattering because you have the exchange coupling J uh, and the spin of the impurity, and mu naught is the um, normal density of states in the system. And hidden in this parameter B is basically the potential scattering that I was um, explaining on the previous slide. Now, what you can also solve for is, of course, the bound state wave function, and you will see that, so to say, this is a Shiba wave function or the YSR wave function. And if you look at its expression, um, you can find that uh, you have an oscillatory behavior indeed in there and a decay, which is kind of related to the, to the Fermi wavelength of the substrate material. So here you can find the spatially decaying part, the oscillatory part. And there's another um, spatially decaying part which scales with the coherence length. But in most of the um, materials that we are dealing with, it's actually the, the Fermi wavelength, which is of importance um, and that we can actually see on the length scales um, of the experiment. And just for completeness, there is a phase shift in the, um, you have both, both um, bound states, of course, at positive and negative energy or bias voltage, and there's a phase shift in between. them. All right, so that are uh, briefly the, the expressions of, of these uh, Shiba states. Now, how can we kind of in a pictorial way see what's happening there? So imagine that we put a spin on the on the substrate. And as I said, there's some exchange coupling. But there's one region where we say, well, the coupling we consider still as being weak. So in that sense, you locally perturb a little bit the Cooper pairs, but essentially you don't break them. And 
if I just draw now the Cooper pairs here as these spin up and spin down electrons again, then this adsorbate spin remains kind of free on the surface. So basically it retains its spin one half state. So this is what we call the free spin state. But eventually you can imagine that you can increase your exchange coupling strength to the substrate. So you really perturb the Cooper pairs of the substrate. And what happens then is that you kind of locally break um, a Cooper pair and attach one um, quasi particle to the impurity spin. And uh, essentially this gives rise then to um, a screen spin ground state. So the effective spin of the adsorbent is uh, screened away. So you end up with a singlet state. And uh, well, the difference is here that now you really have a quasi particle already created by the exchange coupling to the uh, magnetic impurity. So you locally bind a quasi particle to the other sum. Now you see that these are very different regimes, what we call the weak coupling and the strong coupling. And apparently there has to be a transition between these two. And this is indeed a critical exchange coupling strength, which we call J sub C. And uh, at this position, uh, basically, you go uh, undergo a quantum phase transition. I mean, many people call it quantum phase transition in the literature. You could also say that this is just a level crossing. Uh, but essentially, it says that below, when you have a smaller exchange coupling, you are in the weak coupling regime. And when you are um, uh, exposed to stronger coupling, you are in the um, screened uh, spin regime. So now, how can we see this um, if in which state we are, maybe, or at least how do we measure this? And um, well, I showed you before this, this equation for describing the, um, uh, this quasi-particle binding energy inside the superconducting energy gap. Here, I re um, just refrain to the exchange coupling strength. And I plot this, um, this equation basically as a function of the exchange coupling strength J. And here you see that now these are the bound states energies inside of the superconducting energy gap, which is um, just labeled here by plus and minus delta. Now, this is the theoretical description of it. And here you see when it crosses zero, this um, um, uh, bound state energy, this is where we have the, the quantum phase transition. So essentially below, we are in the weak coupling regime. So this is the free spin. And above, we are in the screen spin regime. Um, so we have the excitation, so to say, the other side of the quantum phase transition. Well, but we can't uh, just immediately measure this curve in a sense, but we, what we always do an experiment is we do an excitation spectroscopy. So essentially what we do is we go from a ground state to an excited state. So for example, in scanning tunneling um, spectroscopy, we try to add or remove an electron to the system. Now let's focus first here down on the energy scale again for the exchange coupling strength. We have the atom that's sitting on the surface in the free spin state. And eventually with increasing the coupling strength, we go to the screen one. Now what's the excitation that you can do when you are in this case? Obviously now the one where you bind the quasi particle close to the um, impurity is the excited state. While vice versa, when you are already uh, in the state where you have bound the quasi particle to the impurity, then the free spin state is the um, excited state. And obviously you can do this by adding uh, or removing electrons um, from the system. So in uh, order to understand these excitation energies, I plot again um, the equation, how these bound states follow. Now, just that I don't take the positive and negative because we can't distinguish between them, but I kind of mirror it um, along the Fermi energy. And there I see now that here we have this level crossing of um, here we are in the in the uh, free spin regime. This is the ground state, and the um, um, uh, yeah the screen spin is the excited state, and here it is just vice versa. So what happens is when we do an excitation, we try to add electrons, for example. So for example, if we match with our um, tunneling electrons by setting a bias voltage that's a, 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 um, corresponding to this electron energy, we can go from the ground state to the excited state. And this is where we detect now a peak in the differential conductance, for example, by electrons, which means it's a positive bias voltage. Now we ramp up the um, energy higher, so the bias voltage, and eventually, of course, we reach the excitation that is also possible for reaching the superconducting gap edge. So this is the second BCS coherence peak, so to say, or its expression that we find in the differential conductance. OK, but now nobody tells us that we can only do it with electrons. We can also do the very same excitation with holes, which means that we can do it at negative bias voltage. And that's where we find the peak here. And obviously, we can also do the excitation to the superconducting gap edge with holes. 
So electrons and holes are just labeled here by different colors. And um, while, as I said, the energy is mainly a result of the potentials uh, of the exchange scattering, now this asymmetry is due to the potential scattering. So if I write it as an excitation of these various R states, so we basically have an excitation of a quasi-particle, uh, for example, we can do it either um, by, um, for example, uh, adding electrons or removing the holes. Okay, some, some practical aspects of it. Um, we are going to do this with, with uh, uh, scanning tunneling spectroscopy, but obviously energy resolution and maybe finer temperature are uh, an ingredient that we have to deal in experiments with. And uh, the first thing that uh, I would like to point out that using superconducting electrodes, so not only the superconducting substrate, but also a superconducting tip um, is, a, is a good idea because basically it enhances your energy resolution. So some of the experiments I'll show later are done on a lead sample. The critical temperature is 7 Kelvin, which uh, results in a gap of 1.35 milli electron volts. And all the measurements are uh, I will show you are done at 1 Kelvin. So essentially, when you have a superconducting substrate and you have a superconducting tip, both of these quasi-particle excitation spectra look um, the same. And then when we ramp our bias voltage, we will see expressions in the differential conductance uh, when we overcome um, twice the superconducting energy gap now, because we kind of have to break a Cooper pair and substrate and the tip, and only then we can start to have a tunneling current. And this ends up then in a typical spectrum that we can record on the bare surface that looks like this. And um, it essentially tells you that all the energies that you have are shifted now, um, not uh, by the superconducting energy gap of the, of the tip, um, whatever you measure on the substrate. Now, this then comes to the fact that also the Shiva states um, are shifted by this energy delta inside the gap, and then we can read off our binding energy of um, the Shiva states inside the gap. Now, we are not the first to, to measure um, the Shiva Rusinov states on single atoms. Actually, it dates back more than 20 years ago. Uh, at that time, Ali Yazdani in the, in the Eigler group looked at these manganese atoms on a niobium surface. Um, at that time, they used a metal tip and also a temperature of 4 Kelvin. And you see that, for example, if you just measure on the bare superconducting surface, you can find an expression of this superconducting energy gap by this depletion in the density of states. And also these onsets of the coherence peak. Now, what they find is that when they measure on a manganese atom, you see that there's an asymmetry and actually a slightly smaller gap. So even given this, let's say from today's perspective, rather poor energy resolution, it was already possible to interpret these states um, extremely well in terms of these yushiba Rusinov states. And they have looked also at the spatial dependence and have really set the basis for all the work that um, has been done in recent years um, and I will show in the, in the remainder of my talk. Then there was a huge time gap, 10 years. Um, and then the Shue group again came up with the idea of looking at manganese atoms, in this case on the lead surface, they had the advantage of lower temperatures, but they also took advantage of using superconducting tips, as I was kind of advertising in the previous slides. And then what they measure as a DIDV spectrum just on the bare lead surface looks, of course, much better in terms of energy resolution. You have a larger gap because of the shift, because you need to break a Cooper pair as well in the tip. But what is the most important is that now we have these very sharp coherence peaks as a result of this sharp density of states sampling each other and by this, they were able to look into subgap states with much higher energy resolution, and they found actually multiple subgap states um, on these manganese atoms on the lead surface. So just to highlight the fact again of this energy resolution that, that's taking place. So even if you take a metal tip at one Kelvin, let's say these are also manganese atoms on a lead surface, you look at the spectrum, you see the Shiba state, it's inside the gap, but it looks rather broad. Um, even at larger temperatures, but using a superconducting tip, you effectively enhance your energy resolution quite a lot. You see these much sharper peaks and you have more um, uh, resolution. Actually, you can find not only one state, um, but you see multiple states inside the gap. And then if you lower further your temperature, you increase a little bit the sharpness of the peaks, but actually the difference between changing the temperature then between changing the material of the tip um, is less pronounced. Now, there's some region here that I highlighted by these blue shaded areas. 
where in principle there shouldn't be any excitations because there is only the tip gap. Um, and obviously we try to measure with clean tips, so they shouldn't have any um, Yushi Baruzinov states within them. But here it's still an effect of finite temperature. So basically these are thermal excitations that we still measure um, uh, due to the experimental conditions. So let me just walk you through these, these kind of spectra again. Essentially, it means that, well, we can, of course, measure a high differential conductance when the electron-like states of substrate and tip and the whole-like states of the tip are facing each other. You measure this at the coherence peak. You measure this in the subgap uh, states of the yushiba rubisinov state. But then there's this, this thermal excitation, so to say, that we see. In principle, there shouldn't be any tunneling current at this energy um, if we were at zero temperature. However, because there's the finite excitation by, by thermal, uh, uh, thermally induced, you already have some electron-like state that are here at this side of the um, uh, Fermi energy, and therefore you can have a contribution to the tunneling current. And this gives rise then to these small peaks that are inside the gap of the tip and gives rise to these called thermal excitation, and they're basically just replicas of the Shiva states. Okay, and finally we measure it here again. Okay, so now let's come to some, some real wise R systems. And um, essentially, a spin one half system sounds to be easy. You should get one Shiva state inside of the superconducting energy gap. But obviously, that in, in real life, there are more exciting things going on. Sometimes there are multiple Shiva states. We see spatial dependencies um, in symmetry as well as in extent. So let's let's look at a manganese atom on the lead 001 surface. So well, in STM, in the topography, it looks boring. It's just a little block. We can park our tip on top of the atom, and then we record this blue spectrum here. And just for comparison, in the background is the one of the pristine gap, where you have no excitations because you just measure somewhere uh, far away from the impurity, and you have the superconducting gap of both the substrate um, and the tip. Uh, this inner area is already the gap of the tip. So basically, for now, I said there are only thermal excitations there. But the interesting part is only this part where we find excitations within the superconducting gap of the substrate. Now, you see this very pronounced. Um, why is R state? It's very large in intensity. But indeed, when you look a little bit more closely, you can find um, peaks with much lower intensities further inside the superconducting gap, but also at these shoulders. And uh, while this is just a zoom, you may still not be convinced that these shoulders are, are real and that we really have three pairs, I mean, always positive and negative bias, which gives rise to one pair of Yoshiba of states. But then when we measure the differential conductance immediately um, at these particular energies, you see that there are certain shapes showing up. And while, as I said, topography looks boring, it's just a blob, a protrusion that's giving right, coming from the atom, these shapes are rather intriguing, and uh, actually they need to be explained in a little bit more detail. So when looking at it, uh, we thought, well, they do look like d orbitals, but the extent of it is more than one nanometer. Obviously, you can't measure immediately the d orbitals of an atom. But somehow, this symmetry has to be uh, related to these orbitals, and that's when we started thinking, OK, basically, you put a manganese atom down on the surface. And what happens is that you have a local um, crystal field. So if it sits in the hollow site on the lead 001 surface, um, you have this fourfold symmetry. And if you look into this um, in a kind of three-dimensional representation, basically, this manganese atom feels a square pyramidal ligand field. So if you start with a manganese atom that has five electrons in the D shell, so in principle you would have a spin five half system, you start to remove these degeneracies by imposing the crystal field. And you can use simple crystal field arguments to understand what the splitting is. Um, basically, you could say that the orbitals that are pointing towards the bonding axis towards the neighboring atoms are pushed up the most in energy by electrostatic reasons. And that's why the dx square minus y square orbital is pushed up the most. Then comes the dz square orbital because you have this atom underneath. And then finally, these are kind of on the diagonals of the um, bonding directions. And therefore, they stay lowest in energy. And they remain almost degenerate depending on the precise configuration and bonding. Length. Now, what this means is that um, we occupy these energy levels, again, with single electrons, obviously. The splitting is still low enough that we um, don't need uh, to consider the Huns pairing energy. 
So this will, if you don't go to a spin crossover, we still remain seeing the occupied levels. And now these actually present an exchange scattering potential to the substrate Cooper pairs, electrons. And these now give rise to specific, uh, um, specific symmetries uh, of the scattering potential. So remember, in the beginning, I said that often this uh, magnetic exchange scattering potential is treated as point-like. And here we see an expression of that this is not the case anymore. You should be a little bit um, more careful when you look into these real systems, uh, because basically the Shiba state inherit the symmetry of the scattering potential. And basically what you have to look at is conservation of energy and angular momentum. And here we are in this L2 shell. So like looking from the top with an STM, this pretty much looks like the dx square minus y square orbital. The dz square is of course the one that's protruding the most versus the STM tip. So this has also largest intensity. And then finally in the plane, we see the dxy, dxz, dyz orbitals, and they again have this clover shape. Now, as I mentioned previously, the extent of it is much larger than the d orbital itself. So it's basically your electrons that scatter from the substrate, they feel the symmetry and they have to preserve this angular momentum scattering. But of course, then it can happen on a much larger uh, uh, spatial scale. And that's why the extent is larger. All right, so that gives us the, the, the possibility to look into two close by um, atoms and maybe they will have an overlap of these um, uh, Yushiba Rusinov states and maybe some interesting physics comes into play. So we call them Yushiba Rusinov dimers. And essentially we are asking the questions of if these states can couple and also what the symmetry of these, these states may be. So in this case, again, theory had been ahead of us and they have predicted already what should happen. Here are a couple of references shown down here. So essentially, when you look at these two magnetic atoms and you have the Yushiba Rusinov wave functions, they decay somehow in space. But eventually, if you put these impurities sufficiently close to each other, they can overlap. And now there are two possibilities of what can happen, what the reaction on the Shiba states is. So on the one hand, there could be a shift because basically it's kind of one of these atoms still feels the magnetic um, potential of the other one, or it's kind of a Zeeman shift. Um, of the Yushiba Rusinov states. Okay, this could happen in any um, orientation of these, or in any mutual orientation of the spins. So it could also be antiferromagnetic. But there's one um, effect taking place if these spins are coupled or aligned ferromagnetically. Then basically you can have an overlap of these wave function with the same spin component, and then you can have hybridization and the splitting of these states. So this only happens if at least partially we have some ferromagnetic alignment. Okay, so after having seen that this is possible theoretically, of course, we want to question whether this happens in, in some of the experiments. And while well, I wouldn't have introduced it if it wasn't the case. So here we put two manganese atoms rather close by to each other with a distance of roughly one nanometer. And um, well, in the upper panel, I show the spectrum that I shown previously for an individual isolated manganese atom. So just to remember, um, there were these very pronounced Shiba states that we labeled beta, for example, these shoulders close to the superconducting gap edge and these very faint resonances. Now, if we measure on one of these atoms that has a neighbor, then well, basically the black line tells you that if you look at the overall um, uh, appearance, it's very similar. But if you look into details, you start to see that there are some small splittings. Yeah, You start to see that there are two peaks instead of one peak. Here you see it by these shoulders uh, that are pronounced on the beta state. Um, and if we zoom here into this low energy one, the, the blue one is again the single atom with only one peak. But then you can make out two peaks for the one that are uh, placed in the dimers. Well, maybe now looking at it very quickly, you would say, well, these are very faint signatures and maybe this is not true. But um, I hope that I convince you that this is true by now placing again our bias voltage at these particular um, energies and again recording the differential conductance exactly at these positions and map it out. So this is what you see here. Um, and as a reminder, in the upper panel is an individual atom without any perturbation close by. And we had associated these um, shapes to particular D orbitals. And now the lower panel is where we have um, the uh, two atoms close by to each other. And at here, I again uh, uh, split the panel into very close by energies. So basically these two 
are very uh, close um, in energy. And this is what we have seen at this small splitting in the individual spectrum. And this I do for every each and every of these particular resonances. And the shapes tell you again, well, you can definitely say that this shape again originates from the x square minus y square orbital. This is clearly derived from the z square, and this is from the in-plane um, x, z, y, z orbitals. But additionally, you find features like, for example, nodal planes or nodal planes or enhanced density of states on the bonding axis. And let's walk through this a little bit uh, more slowly, just focus on the, the x square minus y square um, uh, derived state. So for example, if I just do like a very simple geometric um, uh, consideration, I see from the top view this dx square minus y square orbital that looks like this. And essentially I can form uh, in the dimer a linear combination of these states and one will give rise to a symmetric linear combination and one to an anti-symmetric one. So obviously the anti-symmetric one is characterized by the nodal plane. And now if I look at this in the, and compared to the experimental data, I would say that you nicely observe this nodal plane here and roughly the shape that has been outside, while here you have increased intensity on the bonding direction. The same you can do for the dz squared. Here it's not that obvious because all your signal is dominated by the signal perpendicular to the substrate, so it's not so easy to identify the nodal plane, but it is a difference between these two experimental um, energies. And finally, I think the most uh, uh, appealing one is the one when we look again from, from top at the dxz and yz orbitals where we find this particular shape. Again, we do the linear combination, either the symmetric one or the anti-symmetric one. And just comparing these very simple sketches with the experiment, I would say that clearly you find the nodal plane and the reminder of these clover shapes. And here you have this enhanced density of states across, uh, along the bonding direction. So you can do this also um, distance dependent. So as I just remind you here, these are the locations of the atoms marked by the circles. But for example, you can do it at different distances. And when you're far away, you see no splitting. If you come closer, you start to see the splitting. This was actually the example that I've shown you by the um, spatial maps. And if you come even closer with the atoms, the splitting increases. So then you can end up with a very simple model Basically, how are these u shiba of states interacting? It's like in, a, in, in the, in the how to correct, uh, create a hydrogen molecule, right? You do just a linear combination of the atomic orbitals in that case. In, this, in our case, we just do a linear combination of these u shiba of states. And basically, you get then the, the splitting and shift of the resulting energies from the original states um, in, in terms of basically a Coulomb-like integral, an exchange-like integral, and an overlap integral. So this um, equation form should remind you very much of how you create the atomic orbitals in a hydrogen molecule. Just let me point to one uh, word of caution that, of course, now we have these exchange coupling strength in here in the wave functions that we need to um, uh, include in our um, calculations, which are kind of distance dependent and oscillatory. And therefore, sometimes you switch between the symmetric and the anti-symmetric um, orbital in the order of the energy. So the, the one that is bonding or the, the symmetric one is not necessarily lower in energy. And that's why we, it's a little bit different in the sense of bonding and antibonding. All right. So, well, this, this now brings me to the point where at some point there have been Majorana states observed in atom systems. And the um, example has been put again forward by the, uh, Ali Yeldan, and he looked in iron chains on the lead 110 substrate. And uh, just to, to get you to the steps there, uh, we also looked at it briefly and basically also at the single atom level. And depending on the adsorption side, we find two different species, which makes sense because you can have a different crystal field splitting. Now, if you put two atoms close together, again, in this virtue of the coupling and hybridization of Shiba state that I was showing on your previous slide, we can get a splitting of the state. So you already see that neighboring iron atoms, they actually interact. And finally, if you go to these chains, you have a filling of the, of the superconducting energy gap with all kinds of Shiba states. Most probably, they are actually Shiba bands. But the important uh, observation that was made by the Yazdani group, and I will come to this in the next slides, is that there's an excitation at zero energy. And I would like to point out zero energy is in our case where the energy 
um, of the superconducting uh, tip is. So this is zero energy, it's symmetric, obviously around the uh, bias voltage, but in this case, you see that it also overlaps with many other states. Okay, but this has been interpreted as uh, Majorana zero modes. So basically I'll come now to this magnetic chains on superconductors, topological superconductivity in these systems um, and the Majorana states. Now, why is, it, why is it interesting? Obviously, I don't have to motivate it much for this workshop, but since I'm the first to speak about it, well, basically, it's the idea of this non-local storage of um, quantum information. And uh, if it's topologically protected, um, basically, small perturbations by the environment, they don't destroy your qubit. So now, in, in this case of the ad atom chains, there has been a toy model that has been employed to explain it. Basically, you start with this Kitai chain. These are the atomic sites. And um, in principle, you can make a mathematical trick and you just um, introduce these Majorana operators where the creation and annihilation operators are the same. So you have also two on each of these atomic sites. And now what you need to allow for is then hopping between the sites. Um, okay, as I said, because these are not kind of states of your electronic system, they are protected. Okay, so you, you need to decouple them from the electronic uh, reservoirs. So this is why you need to introduce superconductivity, for example, in the chain. You then may have, if you have this hopping between uh, um, the um, uh, atomic sites, basically you, you pair up now different Majorana operators, and in the end, you can end up with these single operators at the chain ends. These are the ones that are now protected uh, along, uh, against local perturbations. And how should we find them? Well, due to the fact that you have the excitation and creation and annihilation operator being the same, basically particle and holes should be the same. So this is why you should find these excitations at zero energy. And the experimental realization, as I said, is a superconducting chain that you somehow need. Uh, but you also need to in, in, uh, induce, you have spinless states. And the idea is that now, um, how do you create this chain? Basically, you want a ferromagnetic chain on a superconductor with strong spin orbit coupling. So in principle, I will refrain to this ferromagnetic chain on, with the, on a sample with strong spin orbit coupling, but there has been also a suggestion that you can have a spin spiral on top of a superconductor where you don't necessarily need spin orbit coupling. Essentially, the effect is the same. So let me start off. If you only had a superconducting uh, uh, um, substrate without spin orbit coupling and your ferromagnetic chain, well, basically, these, these Cooper pairs, they wouldn't be able to introduce superconductivity in the chain because of this this is a spin zero system. Here you have the ferromagnetic chain. And now here comes the sketchy way of why you need spin orbit coupling. You need to be able to scatter into this chain and induce um, topological superconductivity in the chain. Um, and this is um, basically then a kind of P-wave superconductivity, which is induced by proximity to the magnetic chain. And the experimental realizations are transition metal chains um, on superconducting lead surfaces because lead is a heavy atom and so you do have a lot of um, uh, spin orbit coupling. So here are the, the experiments from, from the Yazdanya group back in 2014. This is the first um, experimental realization. You see the lead substrate and then by kind of self-assembly they are able to induce the growth of iron chains on these substrates. So basically you deposit iron, heat it a little bit, um, and then you can uh, find the formation of chains. They have looked at it with spin polarized STM in a magnetic field, and they see that they have spin contrast. So this is how they associated these chains to ferromagnetic chains. And then they measured and, and we're looking for these zero energy excitations. So this is taken with a normal metal tip. Here's the spectrum of the, of the background. And then they found these zero energy excitations. Um, so that means really at zero energy at the thermal level. But the important ingredient is that you have to localize this excitation. And you can find it only at the very chain end, while you don't have the signal within the chain. And this is the reason why it has been interpreted at Majorana zero modes. And there are several uh, papers that have um, appeared in the uh, last years that really corroborate this, this, this picture by higher energy resolution, by spin resolve mapping of this state, and so on and so forth. Now, what I said is that in, in the model system was that you have an atomic chain and you have strong hopping between the chains. So this is so far how Majorana zero modes have been realized. But now I have given you all the introduction about these Shiba states. 
Obviously, they are there in the chain as well. But the essential ingredient for creating the Majorana modes by, was by these strong hopping. But in principle, there's another possibility to create Majorana modes, and this is what we call the dilute limit of magnetic chains, where you essentially couple your Shiba Rusinov states. And so obviously, here's the excitation energy diagram of bands. For example, here, these are the Shiba bands. But if you create um, these bands in such a way that your bandwidth is larger, um, such that you have an overlap with the family level, then you can also open a topological gap. And then you can also have Yoshiba Rusinov states. Now, this tells you, this diagram, that you should be able to tune Yoshiba states um, very well. You should tune the band formation. So I've shown you that by putting two atoms close in vicinity, you can have this hybridization. Um, but you should also have already states that are deep inside the energy gap. I mean, if they are sitting up here close to the superconducting um, energy gap, then basically your uh, um, hybridization and bandwidth that you would need would be far too large. Okay, so as a reminder, what I said at the very beginning of the talk is that, well, you have um, the energy of these Yoshiba Rusinov states, and they scale with the exchange coupling strength, and they scale with the potential coupling strength. And so now we have these two parameters at hand, which essentially can dictate where we find our original Shiba states. So I will go away now from the Majorana states themselves. I will just look at where we can find these Shiba states and maybe how we can tune the energies as the very first step in at some point creating these dilute limits of uh, Yoshiba Rusinov um, bands and topological states created by them. Okay, so basically this brings me to the two topics of changing the exchange coupling strength and even tuning through this quantum phase transition and of um, looking at how the potential scattering or how the density of states actually affects these Yoshiba Rusinov states. And the first one will be on the molecular system. Um, I thought that this was, would fit in the scope of the uh, workshop as well. It's an iron porphine molecule on a lead surface. And then the second part, in order to make it fit for the TMDC part of this workshop, we will look at iron atoms on niobium um, diselenide. All right, so let's look at this molecule. It's iron porphine. Here's the molecular structure. You don't need to know much about molecular physics. The essential thing is that you have an iron center. Um, which is um, embedded in an organic uh, skeleton. So here you have nitrogen atoms that basically impose um, a crystal field on it. Now you can deposit these molecules on a lead 111 surface. It's superconducting. Again, we will measure at 1 Kelvin. And they kind of self-assemble in densely packed islands. Now, the first question, of course, we ask is, are there any Shiba states? And of course, there are other ways I wouldn't have proposed this um, here. Um, and basically, you can find them when you measure in the center of the atom, so directly on the iron center. You see the blue spectrum here. As reference, again, in the background is the black spectrum of the bare superconducting energy gap, and you find these states within the gap. And also on the ligand, you find the states, but with opposite intensity. Well, this should not be um, important for this talk, but just keep in mind that you have a delocalized spin system um, that gives rise to these Yoshiba Rusinov states. Okay, so now the question that we would like to address is, I was saying before that you can always measure them by excitations, by electrons and holes, but you don't know at which part you are. Are you in this green spin regime or are you in the uh, free spin regime? And normally by a single shot experiment, so to say, if you just park your tip here, take one spectrum, there would be no way to know in which regime you are. But I will show you that actually this molecule gives you a lot of flexibility and by looking at the behavior, in the force field of the STM tip, we can identify the ground state and we can even change it. So here's what, what we do in experiment. So we can, of course, typically have, we typically have our STM tip far away from the substrate so that we can treat it as a non-perturbative measurement tool, kind of. But we can also come closer. And obviously, by coming closer, we measure the conductance. We approach the STM tip by a certain amount. We have um, this increase, an exponential increase in the conductance, and eventually this levels off a little bit, and this is typically associated to contact formation. Now, what is nice in the system that you can approach with your STM tip, you find a certain increase in the conductance, and you go back, and it's falling basically on exactly the same line. So this is highly reproducible. 
Um, and so, which essentially means that we can also stop at any point of this position and start to measure the Yoshiba Rusinov states under the influence at different conductances. Now, what we don't measure, but obviously what always happens, is that if you have an STM tip, you exert forces. So obviously we deposit the molecules, they come to a certain equilibrium adsorption side, there's a certain distance between the substrate and the uh, molecule, and this creates a certain exchange coupling, obviously. However, when we come closer with the STM tip, we have um, a Leonard Jones-like interaction potential. So we have an attractive force when we start to come closer. So in a very simple picture, basically you withdraw you, uh, the molecule from the substrate so that you expect to have weaker exchange coupling. And then if eventually you come closer with the STM tip and your attractive forces start to diminish, and obviously at some point you even have repulsive interactions. Well, I should say that this regime where we really have repulsive interactions, we can't enter, but we are actually able to follow this Leonard potential uh, for quite some distance by the tip approach. Okay, as I said, we can now look at the evolution of these YSR states at all these positions along the um, potential. And here's a, a color plot of what is happening. So let me just um, get you familiar with this representation. So for example, this is a color plot of the differential conductance. Red means high conductance, blue means low conductance. And this is as a function of sample bias. So basically what you see here are the coherence peaks of the substrate at these particular positions. And inside you find the Shiba state and you also see that they have different intensity at positive and negative bias voltage. This shaded area is the gap of the tip again, so that you don't need to care about this for a while, because here we only see thermal excitations when we are far away. Okay, so now we approach the tip and we see that there's an evolution. Obviously, the superconducting energy gap stays the same, but you find that these Yushiba Rusinov states, they actually change their energy, energy inside the superconducting energy gap. So you come closer and closer and eventually you can find that they go to zero energy. So this is the energy of the superconducting tip edge. So this means zero energy. And eventually you can even cross the zero energy. And then at some point it curves back um, and it goes to a different regime. I don't want to discuss this regime of very strong coupling uh, to the tip and different transport properties here. But the essential ingredient is, and this is what I will follow as a function of the tip distance, we can indeed look at the energy and also at the intensity distribution. Um, and by doing that, here I plotted. So for example, here I see the evolution as a function of the conductance. So approaching with the STM tip, we see a change in the Yushiba Rusinov state energy. There's a particular point of zero energy. This is exactly where we cross here. Um, then it curves away at some point back to, uh, again, back to zero energy. Well, what is interesting is that at this particular point where we are at zero energy of the Yoshiba Rusinov states, we also see an abrupt change in the intensity ratio. So here we had the higher intensity one at positive bias voltage, and once we cross, we even have it at negative bias voltage. So this is plotted here as the asymmetry. And this is really the hallmark of the, of the quantum phase transition because essentially we change, we have a level crossing, so we change the character of the ground state. So it's not only by chance zero energy, but really we know due to this asymmetry in evolution where we are. So essentially, this means that we can explain our, our data um, by a quantum phase transition at this particular point. And let me just remind you of then this energy level diagram that I was showing at the very beginning as a function of exchange coupling strength. So when we are far away with the STM tip, we have some equilibrium position and we can do an excitation at a particular energy of the Yushiba Rusinov state. We come closer with the STM tip, the energy shifts to, towards the, um, to the Fermi uh, energy. So you get lower excitation energies until you come to the point of the quantum phase transition where these energy levels cross. So this is here, zero energy for the excitation. You go even closer, the energy of the excitation increases again. But eventually, in this Leonard Jones curve, you reduce the force again. So this is why you kind of curve back. So from this, we can um, unequivocally assign the quantum, the, the, the ground state. So we started with the screen state, and then we go through the quantum uh, phase transition to the unscreened state. And we can also now know exactly what these um, states are that we are exciting. 
So there has been a similar observation also by Sebastian Lutz group almost at the same time. Okay, so this gave us the opportunity to change the exchange coupling strength, but now let's look into this niobium diastelenite um, surface where, well, for certain uh, applications, it's interesting to note. So this is this van der Waals stacked uh, material. You may, um, or you will see more of it in the, in the next talks. Um, so I guess I don't have to go into the details of it, but also um, I don't want to miss out the main uh, parts. Again, it's a superconductor at seven Kelvin, but the question would be maybe what's important is this 2D character of the superconductivity or um, are there actually other things that are interesting? And well, I um, would like to know that I uh, want to remind you that we have this uh, spatial decay um, of the, um, with one over R of the Yushi Baruzinov state in a kind of three-dimensional superconductor. But then you go to a quasi two-dimensional superconductor, this decay is much less. It only scales with one over square root of R. And this has been used then, um, well, if your decay is less, you have a larger extent of the Yushi Baruzinov state. So it should be much easier to couple actually um, neighboring uh, adsorbates. And this has been done um, by Kezile Dike, also um, by Peter Lilyroth's group. And they have shown that they can couple, for example, the magnetic moment of these phthalocyanin molecules. I'm not sure if he will talk about it in the, in the next talk. I guess that he focuses on a different uh, topic, but maybe he's mentioning this. So, but the question I would like to address is that, okay, so here you seem to have a difference in the coupling strength, but there's an additional uh, ingredient, and namely, this is the charge density wave. And I would like to ask the question what the role of the charge density wave is on these Yushi Barozinov states. So here you have an atomic resolution image. You can find actually in the right part of the image, it looks like this triangular face. Here it looks like centered. And this is due to the fact that your atomic corrugation is modulated by the charge density wave. Here I zoom in these particular structures. And because the um, uh, charge density wave is incommensurate, you see expressions of these different um, sites. So the maximum of the charge density wave is either on top of an atom or on a hollow site. So basically, this is what you can uh, map out from the atomic structure. Now, I think I have to speed up a bit. So basically, um, what is the tool that we want to use is that we can absorb iron atoms on different sides of the charge density wave while always preserving the same atomic adsorption site on the lattice. So, for example, it's always a hollow atomic adsorption site, but here you can be on the maximum of the charge density wave. Here you can be on the minimum of the charge density wave on some kind of intermediate state and so on and so forth. And obviously all the symmetry equivalent adsorption sites. Okay, so here now, because we have all these adsorption sites at hand, atomically all being the same, but not being the same with respect to the charge density wave, now we can study the influence of the charge density wave. So again, we do it with a superconducting uh, tip, which means that we have an area where we have the tip gap, and then the um, sample quasi-particle density of states looks a little bit more complicated because niobium diselenide is a much more complicated superconductor. It is an S-wave superconductor, but it has either multi-bands or highly anisotropic um, uh, band structure, and therefore it's not one single coherence peak. All right, so now let's just look at three particular adsorption sites. We can map out the symmetry with respect to the charge density wave. So this should just guide you through the symmetries. Basically here you have a three-fold symmetry through the three um, mirror axes here, you only have one mirror axis and here you have no symmetry of the uh, adsorption site. And um, so this should hopefully be something that we can immediately detect in experiment. But what we also find is that if you look into the Shiba excitation spectra, they look very different. So you have very different states. Actually, when you look at it, you hardly find any resemblances. Only when you look at the very low energies, you can find that there seems to be a trend of shifts within these states. So I only point out here the lowest energy states. All right, but what do we learn from this? I mean, so basically we have this um, potential um, by the charge density wave that is inducing some symmetry breaking. And actually we do find the symmetry breaking also by looking into these low energy states of the Shiba um, energies that I was just showing you before, the lowest energy in the gaps um, that you can find here. And you can find immediately these mirror symmetries that are imposed by the charge density wave as well. So here you find the three, um, the, six, the three mirror axes. Here you only find one, and here you find none. 
Okay, so how do we understand now the, the symmetries? Obviously, your charge density of potential leads you to a different change in the modulations, but also we see a change in the energies of the states. And I come back to this particular equation that I've shown you in previous slide, where both the exchange scattering as well as the potential scattering modify the energies. And in both of these, there's also the density of states. And of course, the density of states is immediately reflected in the charge density wave. So we can actually map it out from STM experiments. Here's the atomic resolution. If we filter out the atomic resolution, we only end up with the density modulation due to the charge density wave that I plot here along a particular line. And uh, if we look on where we found the Shiba states, actually find that they scale nicely. Um, so the larger is the, um, quasi the, the density of states due to the charge density wave, you also see how the energy of the Shiba states curve away. There are some regions that we can't access, and this is due to the fact that there are some uh, regions that the charge density wave is highly uh, avoiding because it's energetically not favored, and therefore we can't uh, show you the whole plot of all energies. Now, the idea of the system is now you have to be careful. All your energies, they apparently change with the adsorption site. Um, but the good thing is that you, so on the one hand, you have to be very careful because you can't put your atom on any adsorption site. It has to be exactly on the same one with respect to the charge density wave. But one advantage of this material, niobium diselenide, is its van der Waals character. And therefore, STM manipulation is possible. And in principle, you can build up these chains and again, look for Majorana states. Um, but I have to say, so far, we, we were not successful in it. We didn't find any um, zero modes in these particular um, uh, uh, chains. However, OK, so this could be extended, of course. However, um, I, this material is interesting. And here, I just want to already advertise Peter Lilleroth's talk, Lilleroth's talk uh, who will come in a few minutes, because he's using this substrate and uh, looking at 2D topological superconductivity by absorbing a magnet. And I guess this is a very nice example of then by a 2D character who induce 1D topological edge states. But I don't want to go into these details and spoil his talk, but it's him who will talk about it, probably so. So with this, I want to conclude. We have shown that Yushiba reason of states are an expression of exchange and potential scattering. We can tune the exchange potential scattering by approaching with an STM tip to molecules. By this, we can identify the ground state, the quantum phase transition. On the niobium diselenide, actually, we have additionally this charge density modulation. And this leads to both a change in the density of states as well as potential scattering. And we see symmetries as well as energies correlating with these modulations. And with this, I again want to thank the people who did this work. So this is in particular, as I said, Leticia Farinacci, Eva Liebhaber, and Michael Ruby as PhD students, postdocs, Gael Riecht, and Benjamin Heinrich. Theory, Felix von Oppen, and Sergio Acero Gonzalez, and samples from Kiel. And thank you for your attention.